Okay, terrific. Um, so we're going to talk, uh, sorry for the delay, folks, so I'll try to keep things moving pretty quick and still try to cover, I think, most, if not all, of the, uh, the stuff we had for today. Um, so uh, start with this guy. Um, so uh, this guy is a little bit of history. Willie Sutton was a bank robber in the 1930s, 40s, and, and actually into the 50s. Um, and within the first month of being uh, of the creation of the FBI Most Wanted list, uh, Willie managed to get up on that list. And then he was actually captured a number of times, uh, managed to escape a few times actually, and then uh, was finally captured in 1952. Um, the thing that's interesting about Willie is they, they asked him this question uh, after his career of, um, of robbing banks, of why, why do you do that? Or why are you robbing the banks? And his answer was, well, that's, where, that's where the money is. And so we're going to keep Willie in the back of our mind for a little while as we talk through uh, some of these, these other pieces of the puzzle, and we'll come back to him towards the end. Now, uh, talking about Cassandra and, and Spark and the whole space, um, I think that a, a motivating example sort of helps uh, ground things. And so the, the, the case that I'll talk about primarily here is an Internet of Things use case. And, um, you know, this picture's talking about connecting toasters up to the Internet. We've been talking about doing that for like 30 years, still never understood what the toasters would have to say, but nonetheless, it's uh, the idea that, that we're going to have all these connected devices across the enterprise and out in the world uh, connecting back to some location to deliver data. Um, so we see this in a whole bunch of places. You get things like your thermostats, like Nest and, and, and some of the others who are getting in that space. You see it with uh, connected cars. Uh, we see it on manufacturing floors giving telemetry data for their data, smart metering, et cetera. And, and all of them, the, goal, the, the idea is we've got our, our sensors, our devices out there on the Internet, and they are sending data back to some central system. Uh, now, a central system clearly can be distributed around the world, but, you know, from a, a logical standpoint that's coming into, uh, into this system. And now we have to think about what that system should do. So it needs to be able to receive from these various places, um, and it also needs to then be able to answer some relatively straightforward questions. Uh, those could be questions like, uh, what did that silver toaster say last? Uh, or it could be something a little bit more uh, fancy, like, um, you know, what was the average number of pieces of toast uh, per, uh, I don't know, toaster type or something along those lines. Um, now, if we are at all uh, successful in what we're doing, um, we're going to see more toasters coming on the scene. And our system is going to need to be able to handle the fact that we are successful here and that the growth of the um, – uh, the number of sensors that are out there is going to need to have a, a gr our, our system's going to need to tolerate that growth. And then the other part is that we are uh, certainly going to be in a world, uh, uh, the realistic world where faults will happen. Uh, uh, nodes will go down because of hardware reasons or something. Um, you know, we had this uh, uh, situation um, almost a year ago where Amazon had to reboot a whole bunch of servers for some regular maintenance. And we hear about uh, some, you know, folks that were hosting things on Amazon, uh, their systems became offline, um, while other folks like uh, Netflix uh, were rolling just fine. And uh, we, we now talk about the Amazon outage and not the Netflix outage. So in that context of uh, Internet of Things, we're going to talk about uh, two things, uh, Cassandra and Spark. Um, and then we're going to talk about the two great tastes that taste great together uh, sort of thing with the, bringing the two pieces together. So first, a bit on Apache Cassandra. So Apache Cassandra is a distributed NoSQL database. Um, it is sort of the love child of uh, the big table paper by Google and the Dynamo. Oh, yeah. Sorry. And the Dynamo paper by uh, uh, by Amazon. Uh, big table is really the data structure, um, so we're talking about tabular data with these sort of column families, and you're able to sort of have uh, sparse storage of it. In other words, we don't store the nulls that don't happen for certain things. Um, and it's a very flexible data structure. Uh, and then we've got uh, the Dynamo paper was all about resilience and fault tolerance and having this concept of no, no master. Um, it, that's an interesting element that comes into play with Cassandra that we make a lot of use of um, is the fact that all the nodes are equal. And, and as a result in that sort of democratized world, we don't need to worry um, about a couple of things. So first of all, there isn't a master to go down, and so we're always on. 
And if there's a node that uh, uh, happens to have a failure, say a, a network failure, um, and that node goes offline, uh, the other nodes are able to pick up uh, all the pieces for him. Similarly, since all nodes are the same, that means that all nodes are answering questions and queries to client applications, as well as serving up the data and, and owning some part of the data uh, to answer those questions in the system, um, means that if we double the number of nodes in the system, we really are not only doubling the amount of storage, but we're also doubling the number of uh, questions that we can answer at the same time. So we usually talk in Cassandra, we usually talk about uh, transactions. We merge the idea of reads and writes into sort of one bucket. There certainly are ways in which the read path and the write path are a little bit different, uh, but we usually talk about transactions per second. So when we scale out, we can get more transactions and more data. Uh, one of the things baked into Cassandra, and won't talk too much about that on this talk, is really this multi-data center idea. And so we can have uh, our data centers um, can, uh, uh, the data centers can either be geographically disparate because of um, uh, either or two things. One is fault tolerance, and so we can say that if there was a flood in, in, uh, in say, New York, like at Hurricane Sandy, uh, then a data center there going out, uh, the application can, can go to another data center, say, on a, you know, high up on a mountaintop far away from a floodplain. Uh, and so that's one reason. Another reason for geographic distribution could be uh, the idea of wanting um, locality. So I'm going to do the guys in New York will talk to the New York server, and the guys in Los Angeles will talk to the Los Angeles server. Uh, but for this talk, we actually might be interested in the third reason for having this, and that's that's having workload isolation. And so those. Those data centers can be virtual data centers. In other words, they could actually be in the same uh, location, and we've just isolated them so that if you're doing a slightly different workload, you've got different hardware dedicated to it. Um, and then last, a, a little bit on the Cassandra query language. Um, Cassandra, when it first came out, was admittedly not the easiest thing to use. Um, a lot of the easy use cases, or very straightforward use cases, still required you to get down into the guts. Um, admittedly, the, the harder, uh, more exotic ones also required you to get down in the guts, but you were probably willing to go uh, that far with something that, um, that custom. And so we came up with this thing called the Cassandra query language, which looks a lot like SQL, but is a little bit deceiving. Um, it basically, it covers all the operations that you would do in Cassandra in these normal sort of use cases, makes them very simple, and they look like the SQL analog. Now, that being said, there are things, and we'll talk about this a little later, but there are things that look like you should be able to do, because isn't it an SQL database? But it is not, and, and that's uh, part of where we'll, we'll come into uh, Spark again in the story. So if we think just briefly on sort of how Cassandra works on writes, we've got our little Nest uh, uh, thermostat here. So Nest actually is using Cassandra. And he's going to connect to the cluster. Now when he connects to the cluster, he actually sees the whole set of nodes here. Um, and he can make intelligent decisions. There are sort of all sorts of load balancing decisions that he can make. Um, we'll do something simple. Let's say he's doing a round robin. Let's say he's going to share his workload among these five uh, as he goes around. And so he's going to just tell one of them, hey, uh, it's 72 degrees. And so that node may actually not own the data. And if he doesn't, that's okay. He, he's happy to be the coordinator, who we call the coordinator. I think of him more as like the maitre d. And he says, I'll take care of you. I can route that question to who, who needs to know it or, or who needs to have that information. And so internally, he will pass that on to the node that owns the data. That person or that node will respond when he's done, and the coordinator or the maitre d is able to reply back uh, to, the, uh, to the thermostat or to the client. So a few things going on there that we can actually start controlling here. Um, and that comes under this large umbrella of tunable consistency. So consistency is one of the parts of ACID, um, but it's frequently one of the things that, that we take for, we, we don't really take advantage of in, in the SQL space, but we end up having to pay for. And so the, one of the things that's been done in Cassandra is relaxing um, consistency and allowing people to tune it to the needs um, that they have. And so by doing that, we're in a position where we can um, uh, where we can get different scale out characteristics, fault tolerance characteristics, et cetera. So the first thing to note is the data in Cassandra is replicated. Um, you set that when you set up your table. 
and um, we're kind of distributed by token range. So each node is responsible for some portion of the of, of, of the range of tokens for rows. And so all rows have a primary key which maps into that token and based on the ranges uh, tells you where that uh, data should be located. So if we keep it simple and we said that we had 100 tokens, we don't, we have a, we actually have a two to the 64 space. That number is a little too big to, even for illustrative purposes. So let's say we had a 100 token range. Uh, um, then the node one might take tokens one to 20, node two may take tokens uh, 21 to 40, et cetera, okay? Now when we do writes, we have options as to how many of those replicas need to know the data was delivered before we tell the client that it's all done. And by combining reads and writes and these consistency levels, we're in a position to ensure some things about how the data is distributed, all right? And so this becomes a core part of the application and the design decisions that we make and one of the things that's somewhat interesting about Cassandra. So the first one, the top upper left, is probably the most relaxed. Basically what you tell the maitre d' is, hey, as long as you have it, even if you don't own it, as long as you know that, that uh, you acknowledge that you've received this data, then you just tell me the client and I'll be happy. Um, now, what the coordinator is going to do in the background is he's gonna make sure that, let's say we have RF of, uh, replication factor of three, which is pretty common. The coordinator is always going to make sure that all three replicas get the data. It's just a matter of when he tells the client that things have been done and you can, uh, some assurances around it. So the upper left is the most relaxed. Hey, just as long as the coordinator has it, it's fine. The lower left is just just make sure one of the replicas has it. Right? If one of the replicas has it, I know that it's durably, you know, in the data in the system somewhere, and I'm happy. In the upper right is actually probably the most common, which is quorum. Ensure that a majority of the the nodes are actually seeing the data. Um, and then we can do some interesting, a little bit of interesting things with respect uh, to guaranteeing certain uh, data consistency things. Uh, and then in the lower right, it's actually the most stringent. We say, hey, I need to make sure that every node has actually written the right that I just got. Um, now the lower right one has actually got some challenges to it because if any node is down, uh, then that right won't succeed. And so we lose some of our availability, which is one of the things that we're trying to keep very high here is the high availability. And so Quorum becomes a really popular choice for really two main reasons. One of them is it's a good middle ground between consistency and availability. I'm, I'm likely to have at least a majority of my replicas up at a given time. Uh, and um, as a result, I, uh, I, so I have good availability. And then as a result, I get a couple of nodes actually getting the data. Uh, now, that's the, that's the right side of things. Um, now on the read side of things. So now we've got our client here on the left is doing this query. This is, looks like SQL, it's actually uh, CQL. It's very similar um, in that intersection of space between them. And again, he's gonna contact the coordinator. It could be anyone. Um, and he's gonna ask this question, uh, give me the user ID uh, for, the, for the user whose name is uh, pbcupfan. All right, so the coordinator says, no problem, let me go get that, and consults with uh, some number of the replicas based on the consistency level. So let's say that he did it on Quorum, and so the coordinator is asking two of the nodes for what they have, and they each give him the value that they've got. Now, they may be different, right? We, didn't say, we said before, very active system, we said that you could end up with only needing to ensure that one or two or a subset of the nodes got the rights, so when you ask the question, you may get different answers. And the way we do that in Cassandra is that when we do the writes, we, we put a timestamp. So what the coordinator has to do in this case is he's not trying to see if the values are the same. This is not a majority votes, um, uh, majority wins system. This is a last right win system. So he's gonna check the timestamps and he's gonna return back the value with the highest timestamp. So if we combined a quorum write with a quorum read, we can make sure that we always get the most up-to-date data because we're gonna be consulting one of the guys who got the previous, uh, the previous set. 
Now, this is all interesting. This is a very basic how Cassandra is working, how we get a, a, a basic scale out system. Um, but the interesting part's really not about, especially with the Internet of Things, the individual uh, thermostat, but rather a whole stack of thermostats. And then if, again, if we're gonna be at all successful, this ramps up to uh, many thermostats and, and then zillions, okay? So that's sort of where um, where the, the, the general concepts of Cassandra are. And Cassandra really is well suited to the Internet of Things uh, for the space where we talk about um, always on, so there's no downtime. We're always gonna be able to receive an, uh, the data from the Internet um, as well as be able to serve up to queries. We've got this scalability so that if we get successful, then we're able to scale without having uh, to massively re-architect things. And that makes it a really good choice for Internet of Things. Okay, so now this is a really positioned as being a place where the data is. But like I said, Cassandra <laughs> alluded to, Cassandra doesn't do everything. It's great, it's awesome, we love it. Um, but it does come short by design of doing certain things. So one of the things is that it does not do aggregates. Um, and so it's really been optimized to do lookups and to do writes, but it's not really about doing large group by aggregates or, or even the more fancier windowed aggregates that you get in SQL. Uh, we also don't do joins. So much of that is where we spend some time with people who are new to Cassandra because there's a data model change. And we can really cover most of the uh, join use cases by intelligent uh, use of data modeling. And so we can uh, work around some of these problems. They're primarily lookups, like I mentioned. So we talk about needing a, a partition key. And sometimes the predicates aren't based on the partition key. And that's another challenge that we hit with Cassandra. And, and essentially, Cassandra is not designed to be this full table scan kind of place. So we need to have something else helping us out here, all right? So we talked about the peanut butter, let's talk about the chocolate. So Spark, distributed computing framework, it's been, uh, let's say it went GA, uh, version 1.0 went GA last spring. Um, it's got this generalized execution model, it can make reuse of data that it has already pre-calculated. Um, people talk about um, Spark being an in-memory system. Uh, it's actually more than that, it actually does work off of disk, but I think the, the thing that's really important to keep in mind is that Spark is are really good at reusing uh, memory and very efficient there, and so uh, that pays a lot of dividends for folks. Uh, and then there's this easy abstraction, this thing called data frames, and a whole bunch of other tools uh, that are built on top of this. So if we look at the Spark ecosystem, or the Spark, sorry, uh, product, it's, it's got a number of elements that are all integrated here in one place. We've got a basic core, um, and then we've got a SQL engine, uh, a streaming engine, and then there's a few other pieces that I won't talk as much around, uh, machine learning, um, graph analytics, and, uh, and R and statistics. Um, so this is the general high-level view of the stack of Spark. Now, Spark is a relatively simple architecture to understand. Uh, there's only two roles of the nodes in the cluster. There is a master, which um, we've talked about uh, a little bit before, um, and, and some workers. Um, we've got this, like I mentioned, efficient memory uh, caching and this generalized model, which is really nice, and this uh, abstraction called data frames. Now, if I'd given this talk about six months ago, um, we would be talking about resilient distributed data sets, or RDDs. A lot of similar things can be said about them. Uh, data frames are the, the sort of new re-envisioned version uh, that actually gives a lot more capability uh, but conceptually speaking, um, they share a lot with the concept of, a, of an RDD. So the Spark Master, he's the one who you submit jobs to and he assigns resources to a particular job. The Spark Worker is the one who now has tasks that he needs to do and so he assigns uh, work to the local executors running on this machine. And then the executor is actually the little bit of code that's doing the work. He's the guy who's taking a part of uh, the data frame or the RDD and, and processing um, uh, and processing the work uh, that comes out of that. Uh, so the RDDs or, or the data uh, frames can be generated from a whole host of uh, sources. We got things like HDFS and uh, text files and uh, databases and to the Apache Cassandra. All right. So now we'll talk about sort of how. The, uh, the two pieces fit together. So the way that 
the way that Cassandra fits in under in with Spark is is on the bottom, and so we we can put a Cassandra source or a Cassandra uh, database underneath the the Spark core engine, and we've got this piece called the DataStack Spark Cassandra connector, um, that is basically the interface code between the Cassandra database and the Spark engine. That's an open source uh, technology or, or package that we've got out there. We contributed out. There's others who are contributing, but uh, DataStack is doing the the lion's share of that work. Um, and what that does is it surfaces Cassandra tables up to the Spark engine as a data frame. And by, by, by integrating in at the bottom, by integrating in at that lower level, we're able to take all the elements above it, the SQL engine, the streaming engine, the machine learning engine, and we're able to just reap the benefits of that from this, data, uh, from this concept um, and this, this data structure of the data frame. If we dig in a little bit and take a look at how what's really going on under the covers, uh, I mentioned this Spark Executor. So the Spark Executor is the workhorse. He's doing the processing of the data that is sitting in the uh, in the data set or the data frame. Um, he's taking it piece by piece. He's working it through uh, the 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 DAG of execution um, and and processing it. So the way that it is inside of that executor, uh, we need to take a look at how he's grabbing data from Cassandra. So each one of those uh, executors has a connection to the to, to the Cassandra database that he's making through the, the through the Java driver. Um, so DataStax, another thing DataStax does is is builds a whole bunch of the open source drivers for Cassandra. Um, this one happens to use the Java driver, but there's a number of other drivers available, uh, and he makes a connection to the cluster. Makes a, uh, each of these executors will then pull across a part of uh, the uh, data frame uh, or part of the full data set and bring it across. And so uh, what we do is we split these up, RDDs and, and, and data frames each, they split up the full token range into pieces and a Spark executor will operate on all of the data for a subset of the tokens. So the, just in this picture, the first, uh, the first slice might be tokens one to a thousand, uh, the second one could be a thousand one to two thousand, et cetera, and we work our way through uh, the entire um, the entire uh, data set that way. We can work in these in parallel. So conceptually speaking, we, we sort of have this situation where each Spark node, these orange nodes on the left, orange marbles on the left, are each making a connection to uh, a sister Cassandra node on the right. Um, this is a simplified version. There's really no reason why the Spark cluster and the Cassandra cluster have to be the same size. Um, but for simplicity, we'll just display them this way. And so they buddy up. And so the top Spark node there might work with the top Cassandra node, and they're going to be reading the data that is owned, uh, owned in that space. Now, once you see this picture, you sort of rapidly come to, why are there two different clusters? Why don't we co-locate the Spark process and the Cassandra process on the same node and get these sort of hybrid nodes? We'll run the Cassandra and the Spark on the same thing. That allows for us to do local reads and writes, and we can skip some of the network, performance, uh, network costs of doing Spark uh, here and, and save that. And so we end up with this sort of Spark-Cassandra uh, hybrid. So now that we've done that, Let's take a look at things that we can do now with Spark that we couldn't do before with Cassandra. Uh, so the first one is join. So this is a silly little example um, where maybe I have uh, some metadata about each of my sensors um, that is in this table called metadata, and I have another set of data that actually has the, the temperature readings. And I might want to know, say, um, tell me what the temperatures are for the last, uh, you know, that you have in the data set, but, but show me also the location um, for that sensor. And so this is a, a relatively simple join. Um, they certainly can get more complicated than that. Uh, the second example we got is aggregates. And so now I might be interested in the uh, year and monthly uh, average, uh, or I'm sorry, maximum temperature for each of my sensors. So this is actually going to, to do that kind of full table scan and grab the data um, and, and process it and give us this, this summary table, uh, sort of an OLAP style query. Now, one of the other pieces in the Spark ecosystem, there's a lot of use of uh, distributed file systems like HDFS, and they may be external to the cluster uh, that we've got. Um, well, they're certainly external to Cassandra, which does not have a, a, an HDFS in it. And so we might want to do a join between the two. 
So we have our HDFS data is, say, the data of temperatures from 2014. Maybe they're stored in CSVs or something along those lines. And we'd like to join it with the data that we have, the hot data that we've got in Cassandra, the operational data. And maybe this is a query, this example is trying to say, in this first line, you define the HDFS data set. In the second line, we are defining the Cassandra data set. And in the third line here, we're joining the two together and then doing a little filter to find out which sensors are hotter this year in this month than last year in this month. Um, so sim relatively simple, but I just wanted to give it an example of sort of a year-over-year -year, uh, kind of query. And then the last example is super simple. This one's just saying, hey, what if I wanted to uh, restrict my query based on not the, not the partition key? In other words, I'd like to know every time there was a temperature reading above 100 degrees. Um, and, and, and that's just over the entire data set. And again, Spark is well-suited to, to scrub through all of that data. Uh, because we're integrating in with Spark, we can latch into the entire Spark ecosystem of tools. Uh, one of the pieces there is through ODBC and JDBC, because Spark SQL has that interface. And so we can tap then into things like Tableau and Pentaho. And um, I, I put R here. There is a Spark R capability, but there is also R ODBC and R, R JDBC. And you could leverage those just for getting an extract of data. And then there's some notebook style tools like Apache Zeppelin that's that's an incubating project in Apache um, that we could also tap into. So the Spark ecosystem enables a number of tools uh, that are in addition to the tools that we've got in the uh, in the Cassandra ecosystem. So I'll do a quick word on Spark Streaming. I'm conscious of the, the fact we got a late start here, so this will be relatively quick. Spark Streaming is one of the big things that we're seeing a lot of folks use with Cassandra. Um, the idea here is that you've got a number of data coming in from the ether, um, in, and they're going to come into some custom, uh, into a receiver. And so we could think of this as, again, we could do this with, um, uh, with say, the sensor data, temperature data coming in from our sensor network, et cetera. And then what, they, what Spark Streaming does is it basically makes these little windows. Um, and so these blue, dark blue boxes are, say, one-second windows, let's say, um, that we're going to build up. And so we end up making these little batches. With, it's really kind of a micro-batch kind of approach. Um, and so we build up all the data for one second, and then we can process that one second uh, or, or some collection of them. And so in Spark Streaming, we can say, I'm going to put them in one-second uh, buckets, but I'm going I'm to do, like, say, two every two seconds, I'll do the actual processing, and I'll slide by one second. So that's what this example is at least illustrating. Uh, and maybe I'm doing roll-ups. I could do pre-aggregation. I could do some filtering. I've got anything I want to do here. Um, and then I can take that data and persist it somewhere. And one of the things we see a lot of people doing is using something like a message queue, like RabbitMQ or Kafka, and then pushing it through Spark Streaming and then have the results go into Cassandra. Um, I'll, I'll skip going into the details here, but there's some relatively basic commands that you would need to do to set this up, uh, and it's relatively straightforward by setting up what the receiver is, setting up what you're going to do on each window, and then um, uh, telling it to keep running until you decide to stop. Just a, a quick plug on Datastax Enterprise. One of the things that Datastax Enterprise delivers is Cassandra at its core, but we have these other capabilities. We've got a this Spark integration built into the uh, into that platform, as well as our integration with Apache Solar on the on the search side of things. So now, if we come back to our Internet of Things use case, we can see where Spark and Cassandra really fit, where Cassandra fits is in this system of being able to receive all this data and scale for uh, all the toasters we're going to add to our system, uh, and how Spark really helps us address this broader set of questions that the person on the bottom is is going to want to do with that data. And so, if we kind of come back then uh, to um, uh, <laughs> to Willie Sutton, uh, we really see that the, the re one of the real benefits here of getting Cassandra and Spark is being able to uh, unleash the power of analytics where the data is, and that's really the, the big benefit. So here's, uh, so I had a, a couple of uh, links for uh, where you can go to, to follow up. Again, I won't, I won't belabor this point too much while, um, uh, since we had some time issues at the beginning, and uh, I think I'll pass that then over. To Brian, I think is the next. Is there something I need to do to enable Brian, Devin? Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I'll pass the ball to him, and then we should be ready to go. I think I just did, actually. Uh, cool. Uh, we're, all, we're all good to go. Brian, go ahead and start when you're ready. Okay, I'm going to uh, share my screen here. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm assuming I'm still seeing Brian's screen. Uh, is that correct? Yep, that is correct. Okay. Um, what do I need to do? Obviously, this is not uh, not giving me the oh, you option to go. share. Uh, you should be able to go to share my desktop now that you have the ball. Okay, there we go. Can you let me know when everybody can see that? I can see it, Brian. You look good. Okay, great. Uh, again, as Brian mentioned, I'll keep this very brief. Uh, we got started a little bit late, uh, so we'll go through this quickly. Um, we're going to cover the uh, DataStax uh, implementation methodology. Uh, KPI is a partner of DataStax and uh, Silver Lever partner. We'll also be at the Cassandra Summit. Hopefully all of you can join us there September 22nd through 24th. And KPI has done quite a few of the DataStax implementations in both in retail and financial service customers uh, throughout the U.S. So here's an overview of the, the methodology we're going to cover. Um, we'll keep it at a high level, not get too technical. Uh, just to cover these things uh, to ensure the success of implementations that we've done in the past. So initially to get started, we have what we refer to as the requirements phase. And here, a high level, we're going to uh, do our use case requirements for data modeling, which is very important, security and encryption requirements, uh, service level agreements, SLAs, operational requirements to allow us to monitor and manage the system, and then the searching and analytics requirements as well. Some of the key points here is, uh, and I think Brian said this earlier, uh, get the data model right is going to be key to our success here, uh, and, and leverage whatever you can. So if there's an existing database where you can get access to the query logs, go and do that. That's going to help you define your data model. Uh, you want to be able to define specific create, read, update, and delete requirements. Uh, those are essential for, for uh, the requirements phase. And then also security is important, both from an authentication perspective and an authorization perspective. And you can see the areas that we cover there. Encryption, uh, we have the client application to data stacks, uh, kind of the cluster, to the cluster. And then the node to node, which is the inner cluster encryption. Uh, SLAs are must have and, and are highly recommended. Um, even if you just define them for your own project, uh, the lack of SLAs has led to a lot of project failures, and this always comes up uh, during our implementation process, and we work with the customer to help define those. Um, we have to understand, too, we're, we're building a mission-critical system, so we have to make sure we define the operational monitoring and the management of the system early on in the process, too, and to make sure we build to those, those requirements. And then, as we talked earlier, data stack search, um, we're going to be defining our requirements here, but ultimately we need to determine the fields that will be searched on and returned in the searching process. And you can see some examples we give you as well. Uh, data analytics has requirements as well. Uh, they're, they're important to capture at this time. The key ones that we see out there that need to be incorporated are statistical algorithms, uh, required data sources, the data movement and modifications, security and access, and then there's the other analytical requirements. And we just have to make sure we have enough detail to perform a good design. Uh, step two is the design phase. And again, uh, the data model leads off this list as well. Uh, data access object, data movement design, operational design, search and analytics design as well we're going to touch on. So here in the data model design uh, needs to include key, pay, uh, key space design, you know, our replication strategy name, our table design, and you can see that the components within that uh, that are necessary for us to put this design together. 
And then again, any relationship between tables needs to be noted here. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the joining is not technically feasible within data sets, but uh, as Brian mentioned his demonstration, how that can be overcome and accomplished. So again, we want to identify this stuff early in the design process and incorporate it here. Uh, when leveraging simple data access objects, uh, we will want to keep it simple to be successful. So we want to uh, use the, the data access objects uh, to encapsulate an abstract data manipulation logic. Um, we want to keep this uh, current trend in the industry right now is, uh, is an application development where the projects leverage uh, framework to encapsulate and abstract and represent database uh, components as application objects. We're doing that a little bit differently. And then designing the application data sets as much as possible up front will help in the overall uh, application development and functionality component. And then the last piece is the data movement design, um, you know, the batch, uh, real-time data integration between the systems, ETL, uh, change data capture, data pipelines. Um, these are all the essential things in the design phase for data movement. In our operational design, uh, we want to do as much tooling and techniques as possible. So we want to know how to deploy new nodes, uh, configure and upgrade nodes in the cluster. We want to be able to back up and restore operations. Uh, we want to know how to do cluster monitoring, op center use, repairs, alerting, disaster management processes. We want to have all those things in place. And KPI highly recommends putting a playbook in place to manage the operational uh, design process. Here's some of the search design stuff we talked about earlier. Um, search, searchable terms, uh, returned items, tokenizers, filters, the multi-document search terms. These are all things we identify and incorporate into our design phase. And then you can see the analytics uh, component as well. We do uh, do a design phase for analytics this early in the process. Step three is our implementation phase. It's we're going to cover our infrastructure, deployment and configuration management, and then software components, which include both the data model and the application that's been built to do this, and then our unit testing of the components. Uh, when you're doing application development, it, it, you know, based on your organization, you can use an agile or waterfall methodology. All work well with this process here. Um, we want to cover the deployment and configuration of the management mechanisms. So it's key in a distributed system like this is to automate as much as possible. Uh, so, so try to leverage Op Center, Docker, Vagrant, Chef, Puppet, all those type of components. And then uh, obviously in unit testing, uh, uh, more complex with a distributed system compared to a single node system, be prepared for that. We're going to be looking for specific defects such as race conditions. Uh, that's, those can only be observed when we at production scale or a somewhat a scale of the actual system. Uh, so we always uh, recommend unit testing should be executed over a small cluster, but that contains more than a single node. And then there's other things that you can use to, to automate some of your testing and, and launching things. Uh, those are always recommended as well. Our step four is the pre-production testing phase and, you know, basic stuff here, defect tracking, tools you can use to do that stuff, and our operational readiness checklist that is key to deploying an application like this. Um, you know, it's critical uh, to enable the project team to identify actual issues prior to going to production at scale. Um, in financial services, it's very common where the testing environment we're using is an exact clone of the production environment, just for that reason alone. They want to identify as much upfront as possible. We recommend a two-week minimal period for running your application at that production scale to look for all these errors and issues um, prior to going live. And it may take several iterations of your configuration, some code changes, and, and, and other things before you get the, are able to do the full execution. Here's a good example of an operational readiness checklist, and you can kind of bullet through these. Uh, most people, you'd be uh, expecting this type of stuff. These are things you need to be ready to do and execute uh, prior to going to production. That way, when you're in production, you, you feel comfortable doing it and everything's in place to, to execute on that. Our last up here is the scale and enhancements. And these are to, to highlight the normal operational mode of an application built on data stacks up front. 
So we're always looking for how do we scale this and how can we enhance this, whether it's tuning, performance, more features, more functions. Uh, these are the things that we're always uh, looking for in this phase here. And then you always have to prepare for all the eventualities. Things are going to happen. Um, and you can address this by adding nodes to expand capacity uh, to the system when it's needed. Uh, these are all options you have uh, with the DSE product and, and capabilities that you have to plan to take advantage of as, as you grow. And also the final thing is to scale with DataStax, the enterprise solution, it is, is a nice to have and it's what the product's for. And that's what it's known for and it's uh, uh, dominance out there in the field today. These are just put some uh, reference architecture examples we put in place. Brian gave some great examples. These are some other ones uh, to look at that are commonly used in the field today. Um, here's another one that's a, a cloud-based one. A lot of organizations that are global set up these um, kind of clusters, uh, west, east, and then you know EMEA to do various times of real-time analytics and searching that are out there available to you. Um, to quickly wrap up here, uh, the key things we want to uh, push today is um, one of the things we've been very successful with and a lot of customers uh, appreciate is scheduling a lunch and learn. Uh, reach out to us. Let us know you're interested. What we do is a KPI will team up with DataStax. We'll come out to your location, and it's purely an educational two-hour session. Based on your knowledge and what experience you have with Cassandra, it can be you know, introduction all the way up to some more advanced data modeling or performance tuning if necessary. So that's something we're more than happy to do at, at no charge, and uh, we, we've, we've got quite a following doing that type of stuff at many different organizations, and typically it's geared towards architects, developers, people looking to understand uh, how they can take advantage of the Cassandra product. And the other one is uh, a data stacks assessment call. We can quickly get on the call with you, answer any questions you may have, do an assessment of maybe your use case that you're considering, or make some changes to uh, something you're currently doing today. Uh, the con my contact information is included here. Feel free to reach at, out to me at any time, and we'll get back to you promptly. The other thing I want to remind everybody of is the Cassandra Summit. Uh, it's in September. Uh, KPI will be in booth 111. should be easy to find. And there's a piece right there. So at this point, I am going to change back our, our – actually, Devin, if you could change back Brian to the presenter, and we can take questions at this time. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Yeah, switch Brian back. Uh, we have a. We'll take a few minutes to answer a few questions. Um, first question: What are the cluster monitoring to tools that DataStax offers? Sure. Uh, so uh, the DataStax Enterprise, or actually, uh, it doesn't come with DataStax Enterprise. There's, DataStax produces a uh, op center tool. That's a, our visual monitoring tool. Um, you can use it on um, on some of the open source Cassandra uh, cluster, but uh, has some limited capability. But into DSC, it's uh, DataStax Enterprise itself. Uh, it allows visibility into various metrics going from the sort of Cassandra level and understanding about like read requests and write requests, you can kind of see spiking. You can get down to things like the Java virtual machine and understand how it's doing and getting all the way down into uh, lower level things like uh, disk access and, and, and you know, uh, operating system sorts of uh, metrics. You could do some charting uh, for that uh, to see the trends as things are going on. Again, this is a distributed system, so sometimes it's good to see an aggregated view, and we provide that. Or you can do an individual view. You know, if you have 100 nodes in the cluster, the individual view could be a little bit busy, um, but it, it certainly can help to uh, to dive in at that level. That's on the monitoring side. Um, on the management side, there's uh, there's some alerting that you can do. That's relatively uh, standard kind of thing to have in a in a monitoring tool. We can also take a um, and do uh, some of the common uh, housekeeping kinds of things that deal with uh, backups and restores. We can do things with um, uh, some of the anti-entropy, so there's some maintenance pieces that we would do in the database in the regular care and feeding. 
uh, upgrades, et cetera. And then lastly, there's a number of perform a number of what we call services that are uh, through the Op Center tool that do things like evaluate whether or not you are subscribing to some of the best practices in your in your configurations, and sort of just alert you. I mean, there there sometimes there are plenty of good reasons to not do the best practice, and so we just want to make you aware that you are doing something non non standard, and that's great if that works for you, and it's not great if you didn't know that you were doing that by accident. Um, and a number of other services, a performance service, et cetera, that we can kind of dive a level down. So Op Center is our, our visual monitoring tool. I did sort of skip back, or I skip relatively quickly through the data stack slides. Um, this data stack slide here, I talked primarily about things in the blue on the top. Um, there's a number of things that DataStax provides along the bottom, which I think of as enhancing and making enterprise class Cassandra itself. Um, and so that includes this visual monitoring tool that you can see on the right there. Great. Uh, do you encourage or discourage running Cassandra nodes along with Spark workers? And if so, under what hardware conditions? Yeah, I think the um, I think the answer there is is sort of unfortunately kind of fits in that how long is a piece of string kind of question. It really depends on what you're doing in your Spark job. Um, while Cassandra, we can actually talk uh, a little bit more concretely about the sizes and the, the the sort of prerequisites or the recommended configurations. Um, Spark jobs can go from relatively simple to extremely complicated. And, um, and so I think it really matters. The, the basic sort of configuration we talk about for Cassandra is, is I believe four cores and 32 gigs of RAM. Um, I would prefer to double that, um, but not requirement, uh, certainly. Uh, and there's a number of cloud instances that we, um, that we, we talk about and recommend, uh, Amazon and Google and Azure and all the rest of them. Um, you certainly can go out there and do that. When you bring Spark into the mix, um, a few more cores and a few more RAM, a few, uh, uh, some more RAM really does start to, to help the picture. If you're doing analytics that's going to end up building big models and doing a lot of number crunching, um, that can be putting a, a real stress on both the computation and on the RAM. Um, and so it sort of floats. The general rule of thumb would probably be uh, more like six to eight cores and probably drifting up 4864 gigs of RAM, you know, is, is sort of where you want to be. Um, but, you know, what, what, what I think the, the, the best sort of approach to this is really to, to, to kind of get a good guess and then actually just try it out and see if the workload works. Um, one of the things in terms of sizing, I'll take this opportunity with Cassandra to talk a little bit about cluster sizing for just a quick second, is we don't always do it by data size. A lot of times we do the, query, the, the sizing of the cluster by uh, your query SLAs. So are you trying to get um, high concurrency, say you want you know, 50,000 uh, clients all asking questions at the same time, that's gonna change the cluster than if you only need 5,000. Um, and similarly, are you trying to get you know, very low latencies, you know, I need to get under 100 milliseconds to do my, uh, to do my write um, versus I'm okay having a one millisecond SLA. And so those are the other sort of, uh, I'm sorry, what, yeah, those are the other sort of uh, things that we take into account when, when coming up with cluster. Okay, great, let's take a few more. Um... How about the availability of individual nodes being offline for many hours? So what is the SLA for how long a node cannot be connected to the rest of the Cassandra network? So in terms of how long it cannot be connected, the, the, there's sort of a couple of things mixed into that. Um, the, the, the architecture is designed to have it tolerate the fact that that node is not there relatively indefinitely. Now the fact that it's not there, if we go back to our replication factor story of data is being replicated around, um, a couple things are happening while that node is not there. First of all, I'm only storing some of the data in only two places. And so I'll start to worry about things if I lose another node, now I only have it in one and my fault tolerance is starting to, to degrade a bit. So I do want to address this if I know, for instance, that it's going to be a while. Um, I may need to rebalance, in other words, give that token range that's now missing to one of the active nodes. So if I had, say, 10 nodes and one went down, I could give that to one of the other nine. Um, don't need additional uh, hardware necessarily, but I do need to, um, you know, it's going to be taking a little bit more strain on each of the remaining nine. I could also spin up another 
node to bring it back to 10 and, and do it that way. Uh, after a little while, so if we get network hiccups all the time, that's part of the world we live in, and so the, the architecture is fine with losing a node for like a second or a couple seconds, which is, you know, normal, normal network hiccup thing. And what we do, the coordinator will just store a little hint, that's what we call them, um, store basically what it would have told that node had he been up. And we'll hold on to that for a little while. There's actually a configuration of it to, to how long that'll be. It's usually a, a few minutes um, to maybe tens of minutes. Uh, and then at, some, at that point, it'll say, look, I'm just not going to bother because it's just piling up and it's going to be too much of a drain. And we'll deal with that guy when he does come back online. Now, after, let's say, there was a machine die, a power supply blew up, and so the node died for, for two days. When you bring him back, there's a operation that we call repair. It's not quite as much like it was broken, but it's more of a what we call anti-entropy. I need to get this guy to have the latest data from the other replicas. They can stream the data across to this new guy or, or the, the guy he's revisiting. Um, and then he comes up to par, and once he's up to sort of the current state, then he's able to sort of join and take care of things. Um, and so uh, that operation of bringing a node back in if he's been offline for a while actually looks a lot like bringing a node in as if he had been cold um, and, bring, and joining entirely. So in terms of the tolerating how it, it goes, you can handle it for a long time. Um, it isn't super sensitive to it, but you have to concern, you know, have to be worried about if it's down for a long time, so giving that to somebody else so that there's not a, a concerns with uh, having the data available, et cetera. I don't know, Brian, if you have any other thoughts on sort of no, those. Agreed, I've, been, I've been dominating my answering the questions. And I, <laughs> I appreciate that. That's what we bring the expertise on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go for one more. Um, let's see, try to get a good one. Is there a way to archive the Cassandra commit log since these log files can be quite big? So sure, there, there's a couple things you can do with the commit log. First of all, you, you can actually set up how much commit log space you offer, uh, uh, offer. So we didn't cover this on the talk just to bring other people up. When you go to do it, when each replica goes to do a write, what he does first is he writes to a little space on the, on the disk called the commit log, which is how he knows that it's been written somewhere. Then it will go through the rest of the path. It stores it in memory uh, for a while and has an in-memory table, so there's actually a much cheaper operation to query data that has most recently been active. Um, and then after a while, that'll, that'll grow to a space that needs to be flushed to disk. And that's when we start calling these things called SS tables. And so those are the on-disk version. And so when you do a read, you kind of combine what's on disk with what's in memory. Um, if the machine were to somehow just go down, you kick the plug out, then when it starts back up, he can go to the commit log and replay everything that's in the commit log to get himself back up to state. And then he sort of brings himself online and says, now I'm ready to talk to people. Um, so the commit log can, is this safety mechanism and it can grow. And one of the things you can do is set how big it is. One of the other things you can do is there is a hook inside of the APIs that allow you to, to tell it you'd like to do something, like for instance, archiving. You might do commit log archiving. Um, and so you can say that this, this API hook will get called when we're going to get rid of uh, uh, the file because it's occupying more space and everything is handled there and it's out. Um, we don't ever get rid of a commit log page uh, or file until we know that all the stuff that's been in it has managed to get durably to one of those SS tables on disk. In other words, there was that memory, that memory table I was talking about and then eventually it'll overflow into the and go on to disk and SS tables. We don't want to. We don't want to remove one, the the only disk copy we have until we make sure that we actually have the SS table disk copy. Um, once that's done, we kind of mark these commit log pages as go ahead, get rid of it. It's fine. We're we're, we're covered. Um, and so, though between a couple a combination of those uh, knobs and interfaces, uh, you can really uh, address sort of larger commit log files. Um, Another thing you can do is you can do an operation uh, in uh, one of the management tools to flush the F, uh, force a flush of the uh, memory tables. And you basically do that command using the node tool command line utility. Um, and you say, hey, I want you to take the table called Brian uh, or Brian's 
temperature data, and I'd like you to put that on, flush everything that you have in memory on disk. When it does that, it sort of goes to the commit log and say, it could clean up and say, hey, there's a lot of stuff that, that we did now, so you can get rid of some of those files. So, num number of options, but um, it's, a, <laughs> it's clearly a question from somebody who's done some operational work with uh, Cassandra. It, it, it's, it's, it's a good question. It's relatively, uh, it's relatively targeted to the operational use, though. It's really good. Yeah, perfect. I think right. that's, that's enough for all the questions that we didn't get to. We'll, we'll try to get to in the blog post. So thanks again, everyone, for joining. Again, we will be sending out a recording of this video along with the slide decks within the next 48 hours. So sorry for the technical difficulties, but thanks again for coming. Thank you. Have a great day. Cheers.